So patellar tendinitis, or we say also patellar tendinopathy, is an inflammation of the proximal attachment uh, from of the patellar tendon to the patellar bone, right? And that's an, uh, a chronic uh, inflammation that causes uh, pain on the anterior aspect of the knee. And um, if you examine the knee, for instance, uh, to make a diagnosis, but we'll come back to that later more in detail, uh, is really sharp pain here at the tip of the patella. And uh, it occurs uh, very often in athletes. Uh, many high-level athletes have that. Uh, so in uh, sports which are related to jumping, like volleyball, basketball and so on, where you can have 30 to 50 percent of athletes who suffer from this type of disease and this type of problem. And that's something uh, where the environment, so the coaches, the trainers and also the parents in, in young athletes need to be aware of. So the first and major sign is of, of course pain. At the beginning uh, of the disease, uh, the inflammation causes pain after the athlete has performed sports. And then it's coming after and of course during sports, the sports activity. But uh, at the second stage, the athlete can still continue to do uh, sports, to play sports. And in the third stage, actually, uh, it's pain uh, all the time, uh, during and after the activity, and the athlete will not be able anymore to uh, play sports. So the pain is really located here at the anterior aspect of the knee and that's something which is uh, very typical. Yeah, the main risk factor is of course overload and uh, that's why uh, the environment needs to be aware of this, this type of pathology. If you have a coach who doesn't know about it and an athlete who doesn't know about it, then of course it's getting worse and worse and uh, so you should treat it from the start and uh, that's, uh, that's the main thing. Now overload, uh, just to give you an example, what load acts on, the, on this small piece of, of tissue. So if you're a volleyball player and you jump, for instance, if you land, uh, you have 300 kilos that act on this small portion. If you jump, it's 200 kilos. Now you add these two together and you add 300 jumps um, by, from a well, training session, you multiply all this and you have uh, many tons, so over 200 tons uh, of, uh, of load that act on this tendon, that's like an airplane. So that's one airplane per training session per tendon and that's too much, definitely. Yeah, so the clinical diagnosis, so first it's of course patient history, listening to the patient and um, then very often you have already a sign that goes into this direction. Now the physician has to, to make also a differential diagnosis because many pathologies can cause similar symptoms at the anterior aspect of the knee. The classical clinical sign is of course to push here with the quadriceps tendon being relaxed, so the leg extended, the patient relaxed, you push here on the distal pole of the patella and then that causes pain, that's the typical one. But you need to differentiate it from, for instance, patella instability, from the classical patella femoral pain syndrome. Uh, you need to differentiate it in young athletes, for instance, from Oscoot Schlatter disease, which is a uh, pain, uh, which is a disease that causes um, abnormal growth here at the attachment, at the tibial attachment of the patella tendon. You can have the same thing uh, in the growing patella and that's called sinding larsen -Sohan johansson syndrome at the proximal pole of the patella. So that's what the physician needs to take into account. But the first diagnosis is of course listening. Second is uh, looking at it and examining the patient. Third one is then of course um, uh, doing ultrasound, uh, which is an easy exam. And there you can see if there is some thickening of the tendon, if there are some structural abnormalities within the tendon. Uh, you can also do some special ultrasound techniques where you can see if there is some uh, increased vascularization, so blood support to this part of the tendon. And you can also see, and that's a more specialized uh, ultrasound technique, the stiffness or the elasticity of the tendon. Next step would be to do a normal x-ray. 
that's mainly to rule out the other pathologies that I had mentioned before, like Oscar-Schlatter's disease, Sinding-Larsen-Johansson's disease, osteoarthritis behind the patella, and sometimes you find also some bone spurs if you have chronic overload. That's typical also where you can uh, make a kind of differential diagnosis. And then the last, and that's probably the best exam, is the MRI. That doesn't mean that you should start with the MRI. You start simple and then MRI at the end. And there you can see again if there are some, some structural abnormalities in the tendon, like small tears or so, something you can see very nicely. And if there's also other causes of inflammation, like cartilage lesions behind the patella cartilage damage. Yeah, for at first, actually it's before the healthcare professionals. The coaches and trainers, uh, they can do already a lot by doing a prevention, but we can uh, come, come to that later. Uh, they need to, uh, to reduce load if the, the athlete has pain. They need to refer him early to uh, physiotherapists or to doctors and then reduce a little bit load. Stopping the sports is not an option anymore. We know that you can continue sports, but with adapting the training and then in parallel also doing some, um, some treatment. And the main treatment here is uh, a physiotherapeutic uh, treatment. The physios, uh, what they can do is uh, some local techniques to um, decrease the pain level, like shock waves or uh, what we call dry needling. Um, and then they usually establish a uh, physiotherapeutic protocol that should be conducted um, many, many weeks, so very often over three months, with an, uh, a decreasing uh, or a different load pattern. Uh, we call that heavy, slow resistance training. That's uh, one of the most researched um, um, training um, modules that can be applied. And um, one very important thing, and that's then we come to medication, so when the physicians come into play, uh, they can apply, of course, painkillers, so you can uh, apply injections with PRP. What you never, what it should never be done is really cortisone injections. Cortisone makes the tendon brittle and it takes the biology of the tendon away. And we have very often, we have uh, tendon ruptures after cortisone injections. And that's really a disaster because it's very difficult. Uh, that requires surgery and it's very um, difficult then uh, that the tendon heals afterwards because biology, biology is gone. And that's really something, even if you're a high, high level athlete before an important uh, competition, never accept that someone injects cortisone in your tendon. So um, if you have a quadriceps tendon rupture, that's something we have to differentiate from patella tendinitis. So the tendons, so both tendons here can rupture, of course. Quadriceps is something that can uh, happen, for instance, if you're a weightlifter uh, uh, and, uh, or if you have a bad reception after a jump. And then you can also have a tendon tear of the, the patella tendon, but this is rare. If it's taken acutely, it can be repaired very nicely where the surgeon needs to attach the tendons to the bone. In patella tendinopathy, it's different. Uh, there you have a chronic uh, inflammation and uh, the inflammation is usually in the center of the tendon. And then you can do what we call a minimally, minimally invasive surgery, where you do a small incision here and then you go in with an, a kind of, uh, we call that a shaver. And that's something where you clean the tendon in the middle and just leave it attached on both sides and that works pretty well. We do that arthroscopically, so with the small cameras and so on, that's a surgical procedure that's very fast and usually very successful. You can expect more than 80% of success rates, but altogether we operate like maybe less than five or even less than 3% of patients with patella tendinopathy. Absolutely. So um, you, there are some exercises you can do. You need, you need to see if there is muscle stiffness, for instance. You can have cordyceps stiffness. You can do stretching exercises to prevent that. You need to have a good muscle balance, muscle force balance in the thigh, but also on the pelvis and on the trunk. And this needs to be corrected by physiotherapists and, and supervised by physiotherapists. And then um, that's also something which works pretty well, both on the therapeutic level, but also on the on prevention level. Yeah, so Aspatar is, is unique because it's a specialized hospital. It's a specialized institution that works from prevention, so before the injuries occur, until what we call return to sports. And that's pretty unique. Yeah, so we have every step of 
uh, treatment of diagnosis first and of treatment that is being taken care of under one roof. And that's very special because there are many, many different uh, professions that work together for this good, the well-being of the athlete. And this must not only be professional athletes, but it can be athletes of all levels, of all ages as well. And, and so that's really uh, important and unique. And I would, I would say it's, it's unique in the Middle East, but it's also unique, um, I would say, worldwide, globally. It's something, again, where education of the athlete and of the entourage, so the, um, the trainers, the coaches and the parents and young athletes um, need to be aware of, especially in sports at risk like handball, volleyball, basketball, but also some track and field sports. And, um, and then it's, it's easy to prevent. If you know about it, you can detect it early and you can do uh, some prevention uh, on the field. That's really important and it's insufficiently addressed in the sports clubs, not only probably here, but probably worldwide. And that's something we need to work on.